Hello, I'm Shannon Lawrence, one of the physical therapists at WVU Medicine. We're here to present the pre-op education class leading up to your total hip and total knee replacement. We want to let you know that we have been designated by the Joint Commission as an advanced certified center for total hip and total knee replacement. We're the first and only advanced certified center in the state of West Virginia. There's about 85 institutions in the country with their advanced certification. So we thank you guys for choosing us for your care. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna have this little class here today. We're gonna talk about getting ready for surgery. We're gonna talk about how to get your house ready for when you're discharged home, how your course of therapy is gonna go. Cindy Drummond is gonna present here shortly and discuss recognizing and preventing complications. We talk about finding someone to be your coach, a close friend, a family member, someone who's gonna go through this process with you. Studies have found that patients remember about 15% of their education. So we give it to you in book form and we give it to you in class form. Everything that, the, that is discussed here today is also going to be in your playbook. We do recommend that you take some time between now and your surgery date to sit down and go through the playbook to review the information again to help you remember a few more things. We're also going to start talking about discharge planning. Discharge planning begins before you even have surgery. Where are you going to go when you're discharged from the hospital? Most of our patients go home, but there are times when patients aren't getting around well enough that we think that they'll be safe at home, or they don't have enough help around that we think that they'll be safe. The alternative to home would be an inpatient rehab center or skilled nursing facility at discharge. It is always better to start thinking about these options and discharge plans prior to having your surgery. We'd like for you to set a realistic goal. So what can't you do because of the pain in your hip or in your knee that you wanna get back to and enjoy again? We hear lots of fun things from patients. People want to be able to get outdoor and enjoy outdoor activities. Hunting, fishing, hiking, riding bikes, being able to go shopping. Sometimes it's more basic tasks. Being able to sleep better or being able to bend over to do those lower body dressing activities. So think about what your goals are going to be for after surgery because you're going to be asked that along the way. Getting your house ready. We want you to take a look around your home and, and check for obstacles that will potentially cause you to trip and fall after surgery. Removing throw rugs, having nice clear pathways to your bedroom, to the bathroom, to the living room. Those places that you'll be going in your home when you're discharged. If you're someone who gets up in the middle of the night, you may think about putting up a nightlight. People don't usually turn a light on when they get up in the middle of the night. They get up and fumble around in the dark. You're at a little higher risk of falling as you're recovering from your joint replacement. So anything that we can do to keep you safe. For our total hip replacement patients, you may have some precautions to follow about bending your hip. If you have a low seated toilet, we're gonna ask that you get an elevation for that. And then regardless of the joint that you're having replaced, we may recommend a seat to sit on when you take a shower. You're gonna be allowed to shower in a couple of days after going home from the hospital. It'll be okay for water to run over that incision, but we're not gonna want you to submerge it. So no soaking in a bathtub, no hot tubs or swimming pools until your surgeon says that that's okay. You'll get more instruction regarding your incision care when you're discharged from the hospital. Look at the furniture that you sit on at home. If it sits low, if you're having a hard time getting up and down, adding an extra pillow or a cushion to the seat to make it sit up a little higher can make it a little easier for you to get up and down. So just some things to think about for home. And then a little bit about nutrition. We sometimes don't think about the importance of nutrition while you're he healing, but good nutrition is essential for your recovery, making sure you're getting those proteins and nutrients that your body needs to heal. We don't recommend anything special, just a well-balanced diet, fruits and vegetables, lean meats and proteins, avoiding some of those things that are a little less healthy for us. Particularly if you're diabetic, you really need to have good control of your blood sugars for your body to heal. And then we don't want you to drink alcohol while you're taking pain medicine. Getting medically ready, we'd like for you to stop smoking if you're a smoker. Smoking slows down the healing process, but we also worry about the nicotine. So it's not just about cigarettes and cigars. It's about chewing tobacco or snuff, the e-cigarette or vapor, anything that you're using that has nicotine in it. Nicotine has the potential to prevent bone healing. So what that means is it could keep the bones from growing into those implant pieces and giving you a good, firm, complete healing of your surgery, which could potentially decrease the life of your joint replacement. 
We want you to let us know if you have a change in your health between now and surgery, if you get a cold or the flu, anything that's gonna keep you from feeling your best while you're going through surgery and recovery. Some of those things will increase your risk of developing an infection after surgery. We really wanna get that risk down to as low as we can get it. We're gonna have you stop taking medicine that thins your blood. There's a list in the front pocket of your book. You'll also see a list on a slide here in just a bit. And then if you develop any other infections, bladder infection, kidney infection, if you have teeth that are abscessed or need to be looked at before surgery. Again, this is all about reducing your risk of developing an infection after surgery. We really wanna get that risk down to as low as we can possibly get it. They're also gonna ask you about some allergies today. We always think about being allergic to food and to medicine, but we wanna know if you have any allergies to certain types of metal, plastic, or acrylic. That's what is, your new joint is gonna be made up of. We wanna make sure that we're not gonna put something in that's gonna cause a reaction. We don't see those allergies very often. A metal allergy is more common of, the, of those allergies. If you are sensitive to jewelry, if it leaves a line on your skin where it lays, or if it irritates your skin, you just wanna make sure you mention that to your surgeon or physician assistant when you see them at your history and physical visit. They're also gonna ask you about a latex allergy, and they're gonna ask you about a penicillin allergy. So here is the blood thinning medication list, and this is not everything that's out there. When you have your history and physical visit, they're gonna go over everything that you take, any prescription medicine that you're taking, anything over the counter, or any vitamins or supplements that you're using. You will be aware of what to take, what to stop, and when to stop medications leading up to surgery. Getting physically ready, there's a little exercise program set up in your book under the pre-op checklist tab. Some things we'd like for you to get started on, get familiar with leading up to surgery. We'd like you to do this for a couple of reasons. One of those reasons is some of the research is showing if you can gain a little strength before surgery, it can have an impact on your recovery. We're also gonna do some of those same exercises after surgery, so if you've been working on them and you know how they're supposed to feel, it is easier to get them restarted. We do have a website, wvuortho.com, or you can get to the Joint Center from the WVU Medicine website. On the Joint Center page, the book is online, and then there are some videos to correspond with the exercises. Hello, my name is Shannon and this is Ruth, and we are physical therapists here at WVU Healthcare, Ruby Memorial Hospital. We are going to demonstrate some exercises for you to begin leading up to your total joint replacement. If any of the exercises cause an increase in pain, please avoid that exercise. If you have any questions, please contact your physician, the orthopedic nurse clinician, or your physical therapist. For this exercise, you're going to pull your toes up as far as you can comfortably, and then point them down as far as you can comfortably, repeating this exercise 10 to 20 times, working up to two to three sets a day. This exercise is good to promote circulation of the lower extremities, as well as helps with blood clot prevention. For this exercise, what you'll do is you're gonna tighten the muscles up on your thigh, and hold it for a nice slow five count. And when this exercise is done properly, you should see a little bit of movement at the kneecap, and then you'll relax. And again, you'll repeat this exercise for 10 to 20 reps, working up to two to three sets per day. This exercise is for your buttock. You're going to squeeze your cheeks together, hold for a nice slow five count, and then release. You'll perform this exercise 10 to 20 times, working on two to three times per day. For this exercise, you're going to bend your operative knee or preoperative knee up as far as you can comfortably and then push it back down on the bed. You wanna to try to maintain contact with the bed with your heel and just at a nice, slow, comfortable range of motion. You'll repeat this exercise 10 to 20 times, working on two to three sets, two to three times per day. For this exercise, you're going to bend your non-operative leg up onto the bed, and you're gonna raise your operative leg straight up off of the bed, trying to keep the knee as straight as possible, no higher than six to eight inches, or the height of your bent knee. Repeat this exercise 10 to 20 times, working up to two to three times per day. 
This exercise is for your upper body to strengthen your arms to assist with walking with the walker. You will need a straight chair with sturdy armrests. You will sit in the chair and then use your arms on the armrest to lift your bottom up off of the seat of the chair and then lower back down. You can use your legs to assist as needed. You will repeat this exercise 10 to 20 times, working up to two to three times per day. You'll get a call from the hospital the business day before your surgery. So if your surgery is on a Monday, they'll call you on Friday. If your surgery is on Friday, they'll call you on Thursday. They'll let you know what time your surgery is scheduled for and what time to be at the hospital. They usually will call you on two, between two and five on that day before. When they call you, they'll discuss when to stop eating and drinking. The current schedule is nothing to eat eight hours prior to your arrival time. You can continue to drink clear liquids up until two hours prior to your arrival time. During that period of time, we don't want you to chew gum, um, smoke, or use tobacco products. When you come in for your pre-admission testing video, they're going to give you the Hibiclen soap and the instructions on how to use it. So we talked about reporting any changes in your health, but we want you to protect the skin around those joints that we're going to replace. Keep them clear of cuts and scrapes and rashes. Your surgeon is not going to want to do an incision up through broken skin. It can increase your risk of developing an infection. A couple of things to keep in mind. If you shave and you are prone to razor rash, I wouldn't shave the skin around that joint that we're going to replace leading up to surgery. We did have a couple patients who got sent home the day of surgery because they had razor rash that was going to interfere with their incision. If you get a bite, an animal bite, a spider bite, or a tick bite between now and surgery, give us a call and let us know. So just protect that skin, keep it nice and clear. What to bring to the hospital? You can bring your personal hygiene items, toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant. We'd like you to bring some clothes with you, things that you'd be comfortable exercising, lounging around in. We wanna get you out of the hospital gown and into some regular clothes whenever you're ready to do that. You just feel more comfortable out of the hospital gown. You feel a little less like a hospital patient and a little more like a well patient. So things that are loose fitting and comfortable, athletic pants, athletic shorts, knit pants, knit shorts, no, nothing that's gonna be tight or binding around your dressing. We also would like you to bring some shoes, something that's gonna hold onto your foot securely. So we'd prefer no flip flops. You can bring your battery powered items, cell phones, tablets, laptop computers, you can bring the power cords for those. But if you have something that's one of a kind or irreplaceable, I wouldn't bring that to the hospital. We do have the discharge pharmacy service at the hospital. What that is, is on the day that you're discharged from the hospital, your nurse can send your prescriptions down to the hospital pharmacy. They'll fill the medicine and deliver it to your room before you leave. A really nice, convenient service. Keep in mind, they will honor whatever your prescription benefit is through your insurance, but you'll need a way to cover any co-pays that you typically have. You'll also need your driver's license or photo ID for the narcotic pain medicine. We're going to discuss the day of your surgery. So all of our surgeries are done over at JW Ruby Memorial Hospital. There is valet parking available at the hospital and that service is going to start at 530 in the morning. So take advantage of the valet service if you need to. It's a courtesy service. There's no tip or fee for that. Once you get into the lobby, we want you to stop at the information desk, which will be right there on your left as you come through the main doors, and check in at the information desk. Somebody from the information desk will take you and your family up to the Bone and Joint Hospital, which is the 7 Northeast unit, and that's where you'll go through hospital registration. When you are finished with registration, somebody will take you down to the pre-op area. In the pre-op area, you'll meet your nurse, they'll get your IV started, do any last minute lab work that your surgeon may wanna check, and then they'll do the final wash on your hip or your knee. The anesthesiologist will be around to finalize your anesthesia plan, and you'll see your surgeon right before surgery for any last minute questions that you might have. So let's talk a little bit about the anesthesia options. When you see your surgeon at your history and physical visit, you're gonna get a lot more information about the anesthesia. But currently the two most common types of anesthesia that we're using is either spinal anesthesia or general anesthesia. Spinal anesthesia is where they'll put medicine into your back and that'll make your legs numb. And then they'll give you other medicine and make you go to sleep. So you will not be awake for the surgery. The nice thing about the spinal anesthesia is that we seem to see less side effects. Patients don't tend to have as much nausea, vomiting, those kind of things. 
The other option is to do the general anesthesia and that's where they'll put you to sleep and then they'll slip that tube down your throat and you'll be on the breathing machine while they're doing the surgery. When the surgery's over, they'll take you off of the machine and wake you up and you'll go out to the recovery room. Like I said, when you see your surgeon at your history and physical visit, you're gonna get a lot more information about the types of anesthesia and which will work the best specifically for you. This is the operating room. They'll get you in here and on the table and off to sleep for surgery. We've had a change in our practice regarding the Foley catheter, and that's that catheter tube that goes up into your bladder. The general rule for that is for a primary joint replacement. This is the first time you're having this particular joint replaced. There's a really good chance they're not going to put a catheter in. If it is a revision or a redo of something that's already in there, there is a chance that they are going to put a catheter in. If they use the catheter, it typically goes in while you're asleep. It stays in overnight, and it'll come out first thing the next morning. Again, something else that will be discussed with you at your history and physical visit with your surgeon. After surgery, they're going to take you out to the recovery room. You'll be here about 90 minutes or so. They're going to monitor your vital signs in the recovery room and when you are medically ready and your room is ready upstairs, they're going to send you up to your hospital room. Now, sometimes patients will hang out in the recovery room longer if they're waiting for a patient upstairs to be discharged and the room to be cleaned up. They'll keep you in the recovery room until your room is ready upstairs. After the recovery room, the plan will be to go back up to the 7 Northeast unit, back up to the Bone and Joint Hospital where you're registered. However, there are times where if you have a complicated medical history or your case is complex, your surgeon may decide he needs to monitor you a little closer after the recovery room. There's always an option to go to a step down unit or even to the ICU if necessary. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that you're being taken care of at the appropriate level of care, but for the most part, most of our patients are heading back up to the 7 Northeast unit. So when you get to your room, you may see it written or you may hear us talk about POD0. That stands for post-operative day zero. That's gonna be the day that you had your surgery. The nurses will get you checked into your room and then somebody from the therapy staff may be around or somebody from the nursing staff may be back around. But our plan is for you to try to get out of bed the same day that you've had surgery. We've been doing this for many years now. Patients are doing really well, getting up and getting moving on that day of surgery. So we're gonna start with sitting at the edge of the bed. If things are going well there, we'll get you up on your feet with a walker. If you're doing well and standing, we're gonna to try to walk a little bit. It may be a few steps to the recliner chair. It may be out in the hallway walking around the nursing unit. Some of our patients walk down to the rehab gym and practice going up and down steps when they're ready to do that. We're not going to do anything that's not safe. We're not going to put you or our staff at risk of getting injured, but we do want to get up and get moving a little bit on that day of surgery. We've really found some good value. It helps to decrease your risk of complications and wake your body systems up. And then still the same day of surgery and throughout your recovery, we want you working those exercises, wiggling feet, squeezing muscles, all of that's going to help with blood clot prevention. If you are ordered to have an incentive spirometer after surgery, re respiratory therapy will bring that to you and get you set up with that when you get up to your room the day of surgery. For therapy while you're in the hospital, you're going to see both physical therapy and occupational therapy. We both look at how you do getting up and moving around. The difference between us is that physical therapy is going to focus on your walking and exercise. Occupational therapy is going to focus on your activities of daily living. So making sure you're able to get dressed, get to the bathroom, get in and out of the shower when you're discharged home. That's the other reason why we like you to bring your own clothes. It is a whole lot easier to practice getting dressed with your clothes as opposed to we have hospital pants and slipper socks. On the day of your history and physical visit, you will meet with our care manager, Felix. His role is to begin the pre-authorization process for the medications that you'll be prescribed for after surgery. He's also going to ask you about home setup and start the discharge planning process. While you're in the hospital after surgery, you'll meet someone from care management and they'll be by just to make any final decisions that need to be made and make sure things have been arranged so that when you're discharged, ready to be discharged from the hospital, we can have things arranged and set up for you. So let's take a look at our daily schedule. So it says the nurse is gonna wake you up at 6 a.m. That's only if you're asleep at 6 a.m. You don't get a whole lot of sleep while you're in the hospital. The nurses are in and out of your room every couple of hours. The lab is gonna come around really early in the morning to get your blood drawn so that the results can be ready for when your surgeon comes around. The nurses are going to get you up in the recliner chair in the morning. That first move of the day is a good time to kind of think about how you're feeling. If it's the first or second day after surgery, you may notice you're having a little more pain than you were the day of surgery, and that's going to be normal. 
You may want to get some pain medicine on board before therapy comes around in the morning as well. The way that your pain medicine will work in the hospital. You will have pain medicine that is scheduled that you don't have to ask for. The nurse will bring that to you automatically when it becomes due. You'll also have pain medicine that is ordered on what we call an as-needed as needed basis. The nurse will write the name of the as-needed medicine on a dry erase board in your room and what time your next dose is available. We want you to keep in mind they won't bring that medicine to you if you don't call out and ask for it. What that does is gives you and the nurses some flexibility with how you're getting your pain medicine. You know when your next dose is available, you can decide to ask for it at that point, or you may find that you don't need to take the medicine as often as you can have it. You'll have physical therapy and occupational therapy in the morning. You may also get a second session of physical therapy in the afternoon. It'll depend on your discharge plan, what you're having done, and when you're going to be discharged. But we will make sure that you get all the therapy that you need before you're discharged from the hospital. So how long are you going to be in the hospital? For a primary joint, it's typically an overnight to two overnight stays. If it's a revision or a redo of a joint, it's typically a two night minimum. This will all be dependent on what you're having done and what your health history is. The criteria for you to be able to discharge to home is that your pain has to be controlled with your pain pills, your vital signs have to be normal, and you have to have shown us that you're gonna be safe at home. So are you able to get out of the bed and out of the chair safely? Can you get to the bathroom and get dressed? Are you walking the distance that you need to be able to walk to get in your home and around your home? And if you have to go up and down steps, we're gonna make sure that we practice that as well. For therapy when you're discharged from the hospital, most of our total hip replacement patients don't continue to do physical therapy when they're discharged from the hospital. If you're getting up and moving around and you're walking well, we want you to go home and get up and move around and do well. We would order something for you if we felt like you needed it, but a lot of times our hip patients are doing well without. If your plan is to discharge to an inpatient rehab center or skilled nursing facility, you would continue to get your therapy while you're there. Total knee replacement patients almost always need to continue with supervised therapy when they're discharged from the hospital. So if you're discharged home, the options will be either home health physical therapy or outpatient physical therapy. If your plan is to discharge to an inpatient rehab center or skilled nursing facility, you'll continue to get your therapy while you're there as well. So let's talk a little bit more about equipment. So most of our patients use a walker of some type. It is mostly a front wheeled walker, um, but sometimes patients prefer the walker without wheels on it. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter to us what you use at home as long as we're practicing with that in the hospital and you're safe. We also have patients who their preference is crutches. If you have a walker already at home and you're traveling further than an hour from the hospital, we recommend that you bring your walker with you when you come back for your surgery. If you're traveling further than an hour, you may need to stop and get out of the car and we wanna make sure that you can do that safely. If you do not have a walker already, we can make arrangements for one to be delivered to you at the hospital before you're discharged. A lot of the insurance companies change the regulations and have said that they're not going to authorize the walker till after you've had your surgery. So we will have one delivered to your hospital room before you leave. Just be patient with us. It takes a little time to make arrangements for the walker to be delivered, but we do wanna make sure that you get what you need before you're discharged from the hospital. The raised toilet seat and shower chair are recommendations and are not typically covered by your insurance. That equipment can be picked up at Walmart, at Lowe's or Home Depot. You can get that online. You go to a medical supply store. Do a little bargain shopping if you're gonna pick something up. What you get and where you get it from will vary the price on that equipment. Now we're gonna have you watch a video regarding safe mobility, walker use, stair climbing. Hi, my name is Shannon and this is Ruth and we are physical therapists here at WVU Healthcare Ruby Memorial Hospital. We are going to demonstrate the safe way to use a walker and the safe way to go up and down the steps. To stand up from a chair, you're going to scoot to the edge of the chair, place your surgery leg out slightly, and start with both hands on the armrests of the chair. Do not place both hands on the walker prior to the stand. You're going to lean forward slightly and push yourself up, and then move your hands one at a time to the walker. To sit down in the chair, you're going to back up until you feel the chair on the back of your legs, Step your surgery leg out in front of you slightly, then take one hand and reach back for the armrest and then the other and lower yourself slowly into the chair. 
to walk with a walker, you're going to push the walker slightly forward, keeping your feet within the box of the walker. Step with your surgery leg, and then step with your non-surgery leg. As you become more comfortable with the walker, you can begin to normalize your walking pattern. To go up the stairs, you're going to place a cane in the hand opposite your handrail. Leaving the cane on the ground, step up with your non-surgery leg first, and then bring the cane and the surgery leg up to the step. And repeat. To come down the steps, again place the cane in the hand opposite your handrail. Step up to the edge of the top step, lower the cane and your surgery leg down to the step, and then bring your non-surgery leg down. And repeat. Hi, I'm Cynthia Drummond. I'm the orthopedic nurse clinician. Now is the portion of class where we're going to talk about recognizing and preventing complications. So one of those is a DVT, and that stands for deep vein thrombus or a blood clot. Another is a pulmonary embolus, and that's a blood clot that reaches your lungs. We're going to talk about surgical site infections and falls. So first up, let's talk about blood clots. After surgery, you are going to have pain, of course. You may also notice that you get some bruising, some swelling, and maybe even numbness. All of that is normal after surgery. I get concerned when that swelling won't go down when you ice or elevate your leg. That swelling that becomes very painful, tender, red. Patients generally know there is something not right. In your playbook should have been my business card. And on that business card is all the ways to contact me including my pager number. So if it is something that you feel needs me emergently, that is how you can get in touch with me. All right, let's talk about a pulmonary embolus. Now, pulmonary embolus is a blood clot that reaches your lungs. If you would start experiencing any of those symptoms, any sudden chest pain, difficulty or rapid breathing, any shortness of breath, sweating or confusion, I do not want you to call me. I want you calling 911 or going to your nearest emergency room. A pulmonary embolus can be life-threatening. So I need you getting treatment for that rather quickly. So what are we gonna do to help you prevent that? That is one of the reasons Shannon, our physical therapist, was talking to you about getting up and getting moving. Early and frequent ambulation is the absolute best thing you can do to help prevent a blood clot. Everybody goes home on some type of blood thinner. So that varies in your health history, what you're having done. You may have also received something in the mail regarding the PEPPER study. All those things we'll discuss when you are here to see your surgeon at your history and physical visit. We are also going to give you a beautiful set of white tight compression stockings. Now they're hot, they're itchy, they're scratchy. Believe it or not, this is usually the biggest complaint I get from patients following joint replacement. However, they really help keep the swelling down out of your legs. So we are going to ask that you wear these to both legs for four weeks, for 18 hours a day. Now those 18 hours a day are totally up to you as to how you decide you would like to wear those. I also advise patients not to put them in the dryer as the heat from the dryer can mess up the elastic and then they're even harder to get on. When you are here in the hospital, we are gonna show you various ways that you can help get those on. I also advise patients to remember to ask the staff to take an extra set home with you. That way you do have a pair to wear and a pair to wash. Let's talk about recognizing signs of an infection. So any redness, warmth, pain, swelling, drainage, any fever. And that fever that I get concerned about is three days after your surgery and over 100.5. In your book should also be an antibiotic card. Now this card serves a couple of different purposes. One, it says you have a metal implant. So write your name and your surgeon's name on there. That is also my phone number on that card in case you ever lose my business card. The second and most important purpose of this card is, you will see there are several different procedures listed there on your card. Any time for the rest of your life, you are going to have one of those procedures performed that is listed on that card. 
we want you to have an antibiotic before you have that procedure done. Now this antibiotic is something that you're gonna take just one time, one hour before that scheduled procedure. What I advise patients to do is to call me and I am happy to get that antibiotic called in for you. Let's talk about nose and nasal sanitizer. This is something that we started using several years ago and all this basically is is a hand sanitizer for your nose. We touch our noses two to 300 times a day. So this medicine is gonna help decrease your chances of having an infection. You will get this medicine the day of your surgery. We are gonna show you how to use it because when you go home, I want you to make sure that you are given this medicine to go home with to use. We are gonna ask that you use it for a couple of weeks following your surgery. It is very simple to use. All you're gonna do is put this medicine on the end of a Q-tip and swab the inside of your nose. Those instructions will be given to you on your discharge. A potential complication after hip replacement surgery would be dislocation of the hip replacement. Dislocation happens when the ball comes out of the socket. It doesn't happen often. People don't typically walk around and their hip comes out of place. Something traumatic has typically happened. Falling is the biggest reason why we see hip dislocations. Symptoms of this will be patients will say that they heard or felt a loud pop, they are having increased pain in their hip, their leg is short or long depending on the direction of dislocation, and you won't be able to walk on it. If you suffer a hip dislocation, you'll know it. It is traumatic and painful and immobilizing. We want you to page Cindy if you suffer a hip dislocation. She's going to send you to the nearest emergency room. If that nearest emergency room is not Ruby, that's okay. We need you to get there and get it taken care of. Your surgeon is going to want to know what has happened. That's why we want you to get a hold of Cindy. In the emergency room, they'll put your hip back in place and it will feel immediately better. But we're also going to have you come back to the clinic to see your surgeon. You may have some precautions to follow after your hip replacement surgery and they will be discussed and taught to you in the hospital following your surgery. All right, let's talk about falling after surgery. Falls can be very serious as you can see from those x-rays. You can get a fracture or break a bone. You can dislocate that new implant. You can even open up your incision. So it's some common sense kind of thing. So start thinking about your bathroom. Soapy, slippery, wet surfaces can cause us to slip and fall. Being outside, walking in your yard, stepping in holes, uneven ground, always be very mindful of your surroundings. Making sure you've got nice clear pathways in your home where you're going to be. Free of things like throw rugs, extension cords, things that may cause you to trip while you're man maneuvering through your home with your walker. Watch out for pets if you have any pets. They like to be right where we are and that is usually right under our feet. So just be mindful that they're down there. Keeping your cane, walkers, or crutches handy gives you some extra stability to hold on to. And then just don't be in a rush. Sometimes we get in a rush and trip over our own two feet. If you do happen to fall after surgery, I want to know about it. There is a good chance your surgeon will want to get an x-ray to make sure things are where they should be. Let's talk about managing your pain at home. We are going to send you home with a pain medicine called Roxycodone. It may also come up on your bottle as Oxycodone. It is going to be written for 5 milligram tablets. The directions for this medicine are going to be that you may take one to two of those every four to six hours as needed for pain. We are going to give knee replacement patients 84 of them and hip replacement patients 42 of them. Those numbers have come about because of some recent changes in laws and some insurance policies that are dictating the quantity we are allowed to give you at a time. What I need you to know and to remember most importantly about this pain medicine is we are not going to refill it. This is how you need to think about your pain. You're going to have pain. You're having surgery. However, a lot of our patients after surgery tell us the pain they experience after surgery is much different than the pain they have now. It's surgical pain. And usually pretty quickly after surgery, our patients can tell there's a difference. I recommend to patients that those first couple of days at home are going to be your worst. Taking your pain medicine a little bit more scheduled those first few days is going to help to alleviate that. The farther you get away from your surgery date though, I need you to start asking yourself, if I took Tylenol, would I do okay? And if you can answer yes to that, that is absolutely what I want you to do. I want you to save your pain medicine for things like therapy or maybe at night to rest because you did a lot through the day. I need you to remember most importantly that that medicine is not going to get refilled. Let's talk about following up. 
We would like to see you back in the clinic following your surgery at two weeks. You should already have that appointment as our surgical scheduler should have made that for you. Then we're gonna see you again at six weeks, 12 weeks and one year. Then we'll go two years from your surgery. Then we're gonna go five years from your surgery and then we'll go every five years thereafter. Now this does not mean we won't see it any other time. If you're having trouble, you just need to give us a call. We're gonna get you back in here to see your surgeon. I like to give you a call the week after surgery. I've not had a joint replacement, so it is easy for me to tell you what to do and when to do it and how you should be feeling, but we really rely on the feedback that we get from you, our patient. I like to see how you're feeling, how's that incision look, how are you doing with your pain meds, how's therapy. You were all given my card in your playbook. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a call. Thank you for watching this presentation, and remember, if you have any questions, all you have to do is give us a call.